So let's get on with it. So um, this is the structure of the thought. So glia are a big number of cells in the brain. How many of them changes all the time? But the conclusion is a lot of them. And in humans, at least uh, half of the cells of, of your brain are glial cells. And we're going to look at the normal functions of glia in the brain, and then how they respond to uh, injury and disease, and why they're so important, and why they have regenerative potential, so why they can help regenerate the nervous system, and why you should work with Rosophila. I won't um, stop here very long, because you've had a few days of this, and then we'll go straight to, to my Drosophila talk later. So um, one of the functions of glia in development is in the formation of the brain, and they are structural functions. So different kinds of glia help organize the nervous system and brain during development. And this is uh, an example from the mammalian brain. So this is the cortex. And you might have come across it in your previous studies that the cortex is a layered structure, and so is the cerebellum. They are layered structures. And you have all these layers with very distinct types of neurons that um, they help organize the inputs and outputs to the brain. So they organize the circuits. And this layering, which is so critical for neuronal function, is organized by glial cells. So in the cortex, you have the radial glia that during the formation of uh, the, nervous, the central nervous system, the brain, the um, radial glia will, the, the neurons are produced from here, from the subventricular zone, and then they have to migrate outwards. And as they migrate out, outwards, they occupy positions which are further and further out. Um, so they go past the neurons previously generated, they migrate, and they go further outside. So it's called an inside-out layering. And um, so that in the end, you have the older neurons closer to the progenitor zone and the newer neurons further out. And this layering is achieved because these glial cells, called the radial glia, maintain contact throughout um, all the formation of the CNS between the two um, outermost layers, so the subventricular zone and the mantle zone, so um, the most outer layer. And they, um, they, they, their connections work like the right eye of a bicycle, of a bicycle wheel, and the neurons can migrate all along them and occupy their positions. In the cerebellum, you have the Bergman glia, which are also involved in the organization of the cerebellum. Another um, developmental function of the glial cells is to function as guidepost cells during axon guidance. So when axons, when neurons um, begin to form axons, at the tip of the axon you have the growth cone, and the growth cone in an environment where there are no other axons has to navigate and find its right route to the target. And they do so um, by what's called a stepwise navigation. So a neuron doesn't see necessarily really far away where it has to reach, but it sees intermediate targets, like um, guideposts, guidepost cells that help the growth cone either carry on in the same direction or make a turn. And these guidepost cells are often glial cells. So for example, here you have the glia marked in black with a nuclear stain called repo. And here you have the axons. And the axon, these axons um, are um, uh, uh, an interneuron called BMP2 and a motor neuron called ACC. They're fasciculating together. And then they meet a glial cell, which is a, at a choice point position, where the axons now start uh, separating. And they make a decision. And the motor neuron will go out to the periphery, and the interneuron will stay in. So the, it's these glial cells at this choice point that have triggered the separation of the axons. And here you have another example where you have the glial cells and these two interneuron axons, one coming down and the other one going up. And when they encounter the glia, they meet and they form the first fascicle and they carry on going up and down towards the CNS to form a longitudinal fascicle. 
So glial cells are very important in axon guidance. They occupy choice point, choice point positions where axons make decisions whether to carry on or turn. And this is another example from a textbook um, showing that the midline, you might have come across it, um, the midline has been used, well, was used as the uh, key context to discover the molecular basis of axon guidance. And uh, in all bilateral organisms, like, like we are, you have um, right on the left side, and uh, um, the axons have to, uh, at some point, cross from uh, one side to the other and project to the brain. And this crossing of the axons allows coordination of movement between right and left. And this is conserved all the way from worms, flies, humans, mammals. So the crossing of the midline was used as the key context to discover the molecular basis of axon guidance. And uh, it's uh, occupied by glial cells in Drosophila, the midline glia, and by glial cell-like uh, cells in mammals in the floor plate. And they... Um, um, and, and, and the key um, th thing is that, that they, these um, <coughs> glial cells are functioning like intermediate targets, helping the axon decide whether to cross or not, and then project <coughs> up or down the longitudinal towards the brain. Um, so it's, it's an intermediate target in axon guidance. Other key aspects are structural functions to do with the formation of neural circuits, um, are, for example, again, you might have come across in your degrees um, with uh, topographic uh, mapping, so it is the way the neural circuits are organized in such a way that in the brain cortex they can map um, both structures of the real world and how your sensory system perceives them. So, um, for example, here you have the bristles in the uh, face of the mouse, and they are um, organized in very uh, precise patterns that are completely reproduced linearly in the same 2D arrangement in the cortex. So this is a picture of the cortex of the mouse where you have a point-by-point -point representation of the bristles on the, on the face. Um, and, and this very precise organization of the neural circuits is required for the brain to interpret uh, the sensory information. So these uh, barrels are called barrels, these, these shapes, um, which organize the, the, the inputs, um, are organized by uh, glial cells. So it's glial cells that keep these barrels organized and separate. And you have a very similar um, system in the olfactory system. So here it's the um, uh, glomeruli, the olfactory glomeruli of a moth. Indeed, this is from an old review. Um, and the inputs, the olfactory inputs, come into the antennal lobe and they're organized into glomeruli according to neuronal type, to neuronal olfactory receptor type. And these glomeruli are organized by glial cells. So they're maintained separate. Uh, by glial cells. And this is an example from um, this uh, review where if you remove the glial cells, you um, destroy the organization of the glomeruli. And this is very important to sort the olfactory inputs and allow their proper connectivity patterns. Another structural function of glia is the formation of the blood-brain barrier. So the blood-brain barrier is um, important because it separates um, the brain from all the uh, bloodstream and all of the tissues, and this is important for neuronal function to maintain proper the ionic homeostasis that you need for proper synaptic transmission and neuronal function. So the blood-brain barrier um, is formed by um, endothelial cells in... Um, uh, mammals in humans, the base, uh, base, main, base membrane, uh, basement membrane, and the ending end feeds of the astrocytes that uh, cover it uh, all over as well. And in Drosophila, the blood-brain barrier is formed just by uh, different types of glial cells. So again, this is uh, an important <coughs> structural function of glia.
So um, the more uh, classical types of glia that you will find in textbooks are uh, these ones. So this is what's considered the, um, um, let's say, the normal functions of glia in the adult nervous system and brain, um, whereas functions like uh, in axon guidance and structural can be carried out by glia that might receive other names during development or in different model organisms. But in the mammalian adult nervous system, you will have these standard classical types of glial cells. So you have the ensheathing glia or unwrapping glia that wrap around the axons in the peripheral nervous system, they're called Schwann cells, and in the central nervous system, they're called uh, oligodendrocytes. And they wrap around the axons to enable fast uh, synaptic transmission. Not all uh, neurons in the central nervous system or brain um, receive this enwrapment. So when, when the enwrapment is very, very tight, um, the, you have these myelin sheaths forming that are extremely thick where the myelin goes round and round the axons uh, many times. Not all neurons in the brain will receive this myelination, but um, but um, yeah, and, and there are other, in the peripheral nervous system, um, there are also other types of um, enwrapping glial cells, like the remac cells, that, the remac glia, that will enwrap several thinner neurons at a time. But in general, this is the view, that you have Schwann cells in the peripheral, oligos in the central, and what they do is they wrap around the axons to uh, maintain uh, ionic homeostasis next to the axons to promote insulation and, al and allow fast saltatory conduction. The astrocytes, the um, classical view of astrocytes is that they allow transfer of nutrients from the capillary system to the neurons and they are also involved in uh, the production of growth factors that are, um, uh, that the neurons will, rec will receive and uh, the production of factors that will influence the extracellular matrix, and most importantly, the um, neurotransmitter reuptake. So they are um, close to the synapse, and that will take up the neurotransmitter at the synapse to allow the next synaptic transmission. And the microglia, um, actually, um, they're not exactly glial cells, um, but um, there you are, they, they don't originate originally from the central nervous system, but they are the main or the only immune cells in the brain. So they carry out the functions that you need to maintain um, homeostasis in the brain. For example, if you had any, um, the, the brain, because of the blood brain barrier, it's insulated from the rest of the tissues and the bloodstream, so it's unlikely to receive pathogens, but if it were to, microglia will uh, attack them, and uh, they um, also clear up cell debris and so on. So we'll look at these functions a bit more slowly. So as I was saying, the Schwann cells and the oligos will enwrap the axons very tightly, forming these myelin sheaths, and um, they are uh, interspersed by um, naked uh, regions called the nodes of Ranvier, and this is where the sodium channels are located, and this allows the transmission of um, uh, the neuronal transmission to go in between the nodes of Ranvier and going much faster than it could possibly go otherwise. So this is very important for the very long axons. And um, yeah, so for example, all the axons of the periphery will be myelinated. The astrocytes um, um, are a very important concept. Uh, that emerged over the last, um, well, some years now, is the concept of the tripartite synapse, which is that um, many, not all, but many synapses are not just form of a pre- and a postsynaptic neuron, but they also uh, consist of an astrocyte. Um, and these astrocytes are really important for synaptic functions for um, two things. One is well, three things. One is the reuptake of neurotransmitter, as I was mentioning before. So after synaptic transmission has occurred, the um, uh, astrocytes will take up the neurotransmitter. 
and uh, clear up the sign up so that the next um, action potential can go ahead. And the, the classical um, case is here shown of glutamate, uh, of, of glutamate that is transformed by the astrocyte to glutamine, glutamine and returned to the neuron to be able to produce more uh, glutamate. The other one is that astrocytes themselves can produce uh, gliotransmitters and that um, astrocytes uh, signal uh, via calcium waves and they can signal across astrocytes. The astrocytes can be massive and they can be in contact with each other. So they can send these very um, wide spanning, uh, very broad calcium waves that um, um, have a different time scale to the action potential. They are slower. Um, they have a different range, so again, because they can occupy very uh, wide territories. Um, so it's thought to be another way of signaling in the brain, these uh, slow calcium waves that go across the astrocytes. That, uh, although I mean, less is known about them, but there you go, that's definitely something very interesting. So it would be another way of um, of signaling that is going on in the brain, not just the neuronal um, signaling. And another recent um, uh, finding of astrocytes is what is known as the glymphatic system or the glymphatic pathway, which is that um, astrocytes play a very important function in cleaning the brain. So they have these channels called apoporins that are water channels that control the um, entry and exit of water um, into the astrocyte. And the size of the astrocyte changes with the circadian clock, so during uh, the day and the night. And what happens at night is that the astrocytes, via their changes in cell shape and via the aquaporins, create these currents of water that um, whoosh through the brain at night and clear up all the debris of the brain, like toxins and ions and um, whatever, any kind of solutes that are hanging around. And the idea is that it clears them and it sends them off um, out of the brain through, through this water and, um, and this is very important during sleep. So it's a way of tidying up the brain during <laughs> sleep. And these, um, this is known as the lymphatic system and is provoked by astrocytes and their aquaporins. And these uh, disruptions to this pathway are thought to be involved in a lot of alter alterations to do with um, uh, sleep and mental health and in particular um, with that, it could be related to Alzheimer's as in the normal brain, this system might also serve to remove, amongst other things, amyloid. And um, if you do not remove it, then you are going to accumulate amyloid. Another important glial type that has become more and more important over yeah, the last 20 years or so are what are known as NG2 glia and which classically were known as oligodendrocyte progenitor cells. So a long, long time ago, oligodendrocyte progenitor cells were simply thought to be progenitors to oligos. Then there was a time around the 80s of great confusion in the literature um, on whether the OPCs um, were OPCs or were astrocytes or, or were progenitors of both um, oligos and astrocytes. And the NG2 antigen was discovered, and when it was first discovered, um, it was called neuron glia antigen, because they couldn't decide whether uh, these cells were neurons or glia, as they had properties of both neurons and glial cells. So what we now know is that the NG2 glia are OPCs, in the sense that they normally produce oligodendrocytes. So they normally will be making oligodendrocytes. They uh, form about 10, 5 to 10% of your cells in the brain, in the adult brain. 
And what is interesting of what was discovered um, since the original uh, confusion with the nomenclature, they, they've been called lots of other things as well, like polydendrocytes, etc., synanthocytes, etc. Anyway, so the, the, the conclusion is that they're cells on their own right. They're not just simply progenitors waiting there to make oligos. They actually have functions of their own. And the functions are still very intriguing, and there's still debate on um, some controversy on, on, on some of the aspects. But the point is that they receive synaptic inputs, they express an MDA receptors and are excitable, and they can undergo long-term potentiation. They are in close interaction with neurons, and what's thought is that they sense the state of neural circuits and they can respond to the state of neural circuits at least in several ways, one of which is to regulate the state of myelination. So depending on the requirements of the neuron or the health of the neuron, because they produce oligos, they can trigger the production of more oligodendrocytes if they are required, if oligos have gone lost or something has happened. So they can actively regulate uh, how many oligos you need to make sure that you maintain uh, the proper insulation of the neuron. And I forgot to say, but the oligos and OPCs don't just insulate the neurons, but they also provide trophic factors that maintain the health and the, and the survival of the neuron. The other function is it is thought that they may be involved in closing the critical periods. Now, I don't know how familiar you all are about this, but the, the, you might, I mean, I'm sure you're familiar in a common sense way, which is that the brain has a different ability to learn throughout life. And there are periods in life where the brain is more plastic and it's easier to learn. So typically, if you want to learn a second language, you better learn it before you're 12. And uh, I mean, native, right? <laughs> native level. We can always learn it later. Um, uh, the same, if you want to learn the, to play the violin really well, you have to learn when you're, when you're little. And so on. There are loads of examples, um, like um, children, um, both um, healthy children, normal children, or children who are deaf or blind, develop the same ability to communicate with language at the same time of brain development. So these are called the critical periods. So the, the critical periods uh, where the brain has a greatest capacity to learn. There's a lot of research done on this in birds. Um, and then the critical periods close, and we can still learn throughout life, but um, it's a bit less plastic. And the reason why the critical periods close is that it's thought that you need some stability in the circuits. So it's OK to have some um, plasticity, but you need some stability to ensure that the circuits are working correctly. And um, um, the NG2 protein is, um, might form part of a mesh that is extended amongst all the proteins that might be extended over the circuits to kind of freeze the circuits um, when they've passed the critical period. And could be the NG2 protein itself, or it could be the NG2 glia. So uh, to what extent it's the glia, or what extent is just the fact that the protein might be secreted. But anyway, one way or another, they could be involved in the closure of the critical period. And the other one is to modulate uh, changes in the brain throughout uh, life, so changes in structural plasticity in neurons in the brain. So uh, a number of uh, synapses, complexity of dendrites, and things like that. So the NG2 protein is um, a very large protein. Most of it is extracellular. It's massive extracellularly. And it has also an intracellular domain. It's not very well understood how it works yet. But it is thought that extracellularly, it must interact with something in neurons that is not, not known, an unknown receptor. And intracellularly, it's known to interact with components that normally would be present at the synapse, so like grip and interact with sodium channels and an MDA receptor. But these components are present in NG2 glia too, so they're features normally associated with neurons, but they're present here too. 
And these might be very important also in forming calcium waves in NG2 cells. And intracellular domain is thought that it might also be cleaved and release an intracellular domain that would also regulate uh, gene expression. The extracellular domain can also be cleaved, and it's thought that the cleavage of the extracellular domain might be what, um, what causes this mesh over the critical periods, um, and it might also be a component of the glial scar that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, as this extracellular domain is, uh, contains chondroitin proteins of chondroitin uh, uh, sulfate proteoglycan. Um, and it might uh, form part of the glial scar too. So the idea is that uh, maybe with neuronal activity, when the income of neuronal activity, this might provoke changes in the intracellular interactors, but also it might cause the cleavage of the protein, both extracellularly or uh, intracellularly, resulting in different effects in the glia. And through these properties, it is thought that um, the NG2 protein may enable the NG2 glia to respond to neuronal inputs, neuronal activity, to regulate the proliferation of the NG2 glia, so the OPCs, to regulate differentiation, to form more oligodendrocytes, or to trigger other uh, signals that might regulate internal neuronal function, maybe through this factor that, that we don't know yet, or might regulate neuronal structural plasticity, or might cause uh, calcium signals, calcium waves. So, um, one thing that is a bit um, uh, still unsolved or debated is what kind of progenitors are the NG2 glia. What is totally um, confirmed is that NG2 glia produce mainly NG2 glia, so they will divide, they, might, they remain proliferative throughout life, so they carry on dividing and they will produce mainly NG2 glia, um, which are oligodendrocyte progenitor cells and oligodendrocytes. But um, when they were first discovered, they were discovered as progenitors of both um, OLs and astrocytes. Um, whether this was uh, something that happened mainly in culture, um, what it's thought now, as we will see, is that most likely they produce astrocytes in injury too, whether they produce neurons is very debated. So um, some reports say that NG2 glia can also produce neurons. Some, it's not so clear. Again, could it be that they produce neurons mainly in injury? One thing that is becoming clear in the mammalian, um, in mammalian neuroscience is that um, there is a neurogenesis in specific parts of the brain in the adult and that neural stem cells in the adult brain are of glial origin. So um, radial glia, for example, have been shown to be uh, progenitors of neural cells, of neurons, and um, NG2 glia, um, according to some reports, might actually be also neural stem cells in the brain. And this is, if, if this is so, this is extremely important because um, there are um, between five or 10% of your cells in the brain are NG2 glia. And then the question um, that it provokes is, well, what's the potential of this cell in different parts of the brain? Is it equal or, uh, or not? Or is it throughout adult life? Or is it just in injury or in abnormal conditions and so on? So we're going to mention a little bit about the um, diseases and injury of the brain. And I'm going to go more quickly over diseases because I want to focus on injury and regeneration. So as I was saying, because the glial cells are stem cells, are neural stem cells, and because the glial cells can proliferate throughout life, um, this explains why a lot of the brain tumors are actually of glial origin. Um, and in fact, a lot of the brain tumors are related to the OPC uh, um, NG2 astrocyte uh, cell lineage. 
Another dis important disease that affects glial cells is multiple sclerosis, and this is an autoimmune disease that attacks the myelin sheath that envelops the um, uh, CNS axons. It is not clear what sets it off, whether it starts as an autoimmune uh, reaction that causes inflammation and this leads to neurodegeneration, so you end up with loss of myelin and then you have impaired neuronal function, or whether it's the other way around, whether you have an, an initial impairment in neuronal health and this triggers an immune response that causes uh, further inflammation and further glial and neuronal death. The important thing is that it's, multiple sclerosis is the loss of myelin, with, uh, which leads to the, the loss of uh, saltatory conduction. And um, there are model, mammalian models, mouse models of multiple sclerosis that um, try to reproduce the immune reaction against myelin. Um, the, an interesting thing is that in multiple sclerosis you have a characteristic phases of relapses and remissions when the um, symptoms get better. And these remissions correspond to phases where the NG2 glia, the OPCs, are proliferating and lead to some spontaneous remyelination. So um, one of the, um, one of the uh, therapeutic tactics to treat uh, multiple sclerosis is to try to find, to try to understand ways in which you can activate the um, somewhat limited spontaneous remyelination that you would have during these phases. So could it be that you can, you could manipulate the NG2 glia to encourage the spontaneous remyelination? So I want to talk more about spinal cord injury. You're all aware of how um, bad it is if you break your back and you are lost, um, you are left uh, paralyzed at different uh, heights of your back. So what happens in spinal cord injury? So um, the problems with it, so the, the, the state of spinal cord injury is that if you break your back, you're paralytic. So there is no regeneration in the CNS, all right? That's there, that's that. So there is no regeneration, and what we are trying to understand is why is there no regeneration, and how can we um, work with the cells to help them regenerate? So if we can understand how cells work, even if there is normally no regeneration, how can we make them regenerate, even if that normally wouldn't happen? So we need to understand why there is no regeneration, and how do cells work so that we might make them regenerate? So this is what's happening. You have broken axons. So if you have a broken uh, long axon, the distal axon will degenerate, and the proximal axon close to the soma will not regrow, will not normally regrow. Part of the reason why it doesn't regrow, of course you have lots of cell death, sure. So you will also have lots of neuronal death and glial death, which is actually here. Um, so the neurons that are still there, uh, why doesn't the axon grow? The reason why it doesn't grow is because in the environment that the axon encounters, it's full of, of inhibitors of axon guidance. So the, the normal uh, environment that an axon would normally find in development is not there. And instead, there are inhibitors which are normally associated with uh, myelin, products in myelin. Furthermore, uh, glial scar forms, so scar tissue forms, and this is formed by the astrocytes, and the axons cannot grow. There is an inflammation, which is further attack by microglia to the brain, which keeps making the, the insult worse and leading to cell death. So any approach to regeneration needs to understand this, needs to understand how you can re-establish axonal connections that lead, ultimately, what you need is to recover normal behavior, locomotion. So this might, recover, this might imply you might need to make new neurons, um, and you definitely need to re-establish circuits. So these are the different uh, responses of glia to um, injury. The microglia, the protective, so you have repair responses, so glia are really important in response to injury because they help mend the injury. So they carry out repair responses. The microglia carries out a repair response. 
which is really important. It's an immune type response, which is that they go to the injury site and they clear up the mess. So they will engulf apoptotic cells, cells that are dying as a result of the injury. They will engulf cell debris, bits of fragments of cells. So they clear up the, me the mess. The problem is that if the microglia get uh, activated, um, so if they are activated too much, they cause inflammation and they will start attacking the cells. And not only they engulf uh, dead cells, but they will take other cells and cause them to die. Astrocytes from the glial scar. The glial scar is a really important response to injury. It's a repair response because what it does is it contains the injury. So they produce these uh, chondroitin sulfate proteoglycans that will um, block the lesion. They kind of form a kind of glue over the lesion. And uh, it's really important because it contains the lesion. It stops it from expanding um, more. The problem is that for the same properties, it prevents axonal growth. So that's a problem if the axon needs to reconnect again. And the NG2 glia have a different response to injury, and they have the initial response to injury is a um, spontaneous tendency to remyelinate. So what they do upon an injury is they will produce trophic factors, they will undergo cell division, and they will re enwrap spontaneously axons. And these responses are uh, thought to be regenerative because they can lead to some recovery of behavior, of locomotion. Now, this recovery is very limited, and because the responses to injury are compounded by also the negative effects, the consequence is that there is no true recovery of full behavior. But this is the reason why it corresponds also to the remitting phases of multiple sclerosis, because you have some spontaneous remyelination. So this is what's happening. Here you have an injury to the spinal cord, and you have a lot of cell death. You um, normally, glia will be pro providing both astrocytes and uh, OPCs will be uh, producing trophic factors that maintain neurons alive. Um, you have a lot of myelin debris, so uh, these will be cleared by the microglia, which is good, but they can also provoke an inflammatory reaction. And you will have the glial scar, which contains the wound but prevents axonal growth. And you have the limited remyelination. So we're going to look a bit more slowly at the different ones. So as I was saying, the microglia are the immune cells of the CNS. They are essentially neuroprotective because they help they are the only cells that can maintain the homeostasis of the brain in the sense of clearing up the pathogens and infectious agents that might somehow cross the blood-brain barrier and get there because the immune system cannot get into the brain. They clear up the cell debris and they're very important to clear up any abnormal proteostasis, so any abnormal accumulation of proteins, including things like amyloid and alpha symmetry. In the normal brain, um, without any insult of any kind, they are thought, they're less understood, but they are thought that maybe what they are doing is regulating structural plasticity and homeostasis, so the state of how many synapses you need and dendritic complexity and so on. So the microglia, the, the problem with the microglia, and well, the problem with, with the nervous system in general is how to get the balance right between the positive functions that are absolutely needed to maintain homeostasis and to deal with injury and disease, and the negative things that can emerge when they are overactive. So this is an example also of what um, can happen in other conditions, not just in injury, but in neurodegenerative diseases or neuroinflammation, where the microglia cannot cope anymore because maybe they're saturated, there's too much amyloid, and they cannot cope and clear it all up or when they actually become overactivated. So in the normal condition, the microglia um, have a ramified um, morphology, and their functions, as I was saying, are not completely understood, but they are thought to be regulating structural plasticity in the brain. So the state of dend how many dendrites you need, or dendritic spines, or and dendritic complexity or so on. 
When they are activated, which can be in a variety of conditions, one of which is injury, but it could also be in stress, in other mental health uh, disease, uh, condition, in other brain diseases, they start producing pro-inflammatory cytokines that um, what they do essentially is turn functions that normally maintain homeostasis, they start kind of attacking um, synapses or neurons. So they can lead to cell death. So um, in fact, um, the um, consequence is that when you have activated microglia, you're going to have a reduction in uh, structural plasticity, you have an increase in synaptic loss, you have a, a reduction in uh, dendritic spines or dendritic complexity. And one of the strategies that is thought to be important to restore brain homeostasis, for example, and also in mental health, like with antidepressants, is that the way some antidepressants might work is through the encouraging the normal homeostatic functions of ramified microglia to increase, again, dendritic complexity, dendritic spine density, um, for the production of more growth factors, and maybe even stimulate neurogenesis. And it's thought that PDNF, one of the neurotrophins, might be involved in these processes. And most neurodepressants function by um, upregulating the levels of PDNF. So, for these reasons, uh, microglia are very important in the context also of injury as well as disease. And the key thing is how to get the balance right to encourage the positive functions and reduce the negative functions. The glial scar is from biastrocyte, and, and the, the critical thing about the glial scar is that it contains the wound, but it, pre it prevents axonal growth, and it's formed by the secretion of, of, of these uh, proteins. Now, uh, a classical old strategy to promoting CNS regeneration had been for a long time to try to dissolve the glial scar with the logic that if you need to encourage axonal growth, you need to remove the glial scar. Um, so a big effort was uh, placed on that. The problem is that if you dissolve the glial scar, <laughs> the wound it carries on expanding, and uh, it also causes inflammation. It can lead to the breakdown of the blood-brain barrier, so it, it's a bit of a mess. So dissolving the glial, the glial scar does not seem to work. The other is to create a bridge, um, because it was shown that other glial cells, like for example Schwann cells, are more permissive to axonal growth than um, CNS, um, than the, the context that you have in the CNS after injury because of the scar. So, you, so experiments were done to, to create a bridge of Schwann cells, peripheral glia, over the lesion, and axons would, that would allow axons to get into the lesion because they like the Schwann cells. The problem is that they like the Schwann cells so much that they don't leave the bridge, so that doesn't help either. So um, other approaches to try to deal with axonal inhibition and to uh, help axons re regrow, so the proximal axon regrow again, and to create an environment which is permissive to axonal growth has been or is to tackle the molecular mechanisms of what is inhibiting axonal growth. And here are just some of examples of the approaches. It is known that myelin uh, produces at least, so, so myelin fragments are known to be sources of inhibitors to axonal growth during injury. And um, in myelin of, of oligodendrocytes, there are at least two important factors known to be present there. One is called NOGO, which was called NOGO because it inhibits axons. <laughs> yeah. And the production of chondroitin sulfate proteoglycans, um, which are received by the axons. So the axons are known to have NOGO receptors that um, interact with other receptor types, <coughs> like P75. 
The receptor for the chondritis of the proteoglycans that are inhibitor to axonal growth is not known, but it's thought there must be one there that are sensed, um, that sense these signals coming from the glia. These are produced, as I said before, by both astrocytes and NG2 glia. So, so an approach is to try to see, okay, what have we got here in the axon and what is it sensing of these proteins produced by uh, myelin or by glial cells um, that are inhibitory to axonal growth. So some attention has been paid to NOVO and the approaches have been to try to use antibodies to interfere with NOVO signaling. So one, because no, the normal function of NOVO is known to be to inhibit axonal growth, the reason why it is there in the adult brain is that it's a bit similar to the story I was telling you before with the uh, closure of the critical periods. It's thought that in the adult brain, a no-go is there to prevent that you have excessive growth that uh, will disturb the stability of circuits. So in injury, of course, you don't want that. That's a problem when you're trying to make re-establish connections. So an approach has been to try to use antibodies to no-go that will block no-go signaling. And in that sense, if the axon doesn't receive no-go, then it should be able to, to work. And this had some um, positive results and improved locomotion somewhat in models. And the other, well, the, the other favored approach is now to use antibodies to the no-go receptor instead of no-go, because it's thought that um, this might work better because of the way that NOGO can interact with multiple <coughs> other proteins in the axon, like P75 and so on. So if you block the receptor, you're more likely to have a more complex and more uh, strong output. And some, there has been some regrowth of axons with this approach. Now what I want to talk more about, and we, I'll focus uh, in our research, uh, talk later is the regenerative response of oligodendrocyte progenitor cells. So this is the way they respond to injury. It's a bit different from the repair responses of microglia and astrocytes. What the OPCs do is when you have an injury to the spinal cord, they, you, you will have a lot of cell death, both of neurons, glia, of all sorts. But the OPCs that remain will proliferate. So the injury will um, provoke the proliferation of the remaining OPCs that will form more oligodendrocytes and they will spontaneously remyelinate. And when this happens, you have some recovery of locomotion. The remyelination, as you can see in the drawing, is not as um, pronounced as the one that takes place normally in normal um, development in normal structure, but it is nonetheless there and it leads to some functional recovery. If you have too much cell death, then of course you have a progressive decline if you have no remyelination and, and you just have degeneration. Now, the interesting thing is that this, this response is regenerative, uh, it's spontaneous, um, and it consists of the proliferation, remyelination, and functional recovery, and one of the key questions is, why is it so uh, regenerative? Now, uh, as I mentioned before, it could be because these NG2 glia closely interact with neurons and regulate neuronal function. It could be because of all of these debated um, uh, studies, debated results, um, of not knowing quite precisely what kind of cells NG2 glia or OPCs give rise to. It's possible that in injury, they give rise to progeny cells that are different from the ones that you normally find in a normal adult brain. And it could be that in injury, they also give rise to more neurons. So you're in actually inducing neurogenesis. And could it be that maybe because of this, um, the, these NG2 glia are um, so pro-regenerative? The interesting thing is that um, from about 1989, I think, was the first report. It's been found that um, transplantation, it was originally discovered with the olfactory and sheathing glia. 
the olfactory and sheathing glia are glia of the CNS that enwrap axons like oligodendrocytes and uh, Schwann cells, but do not form myelin, so they don't have the characteristic myelin proteins. Um, and um, um, it was found that transplantation of olfactory and sheathing glia, which are in the olfactory bulb, um, promote the recovery of locomotion in rats, mice. This was um, discovered first in 1989, and then it's been subsequently tested um, in rice, mites, dogs, um, rats, mice, dogs, chimps, and I'll sh I was going, to, yeah, and, and more recently in humans. So the, the, um, the good thing is that you transplant neurons from the olfactory bulb, which um, means you will not reject them because they're your own. The, so you transplant them to the site of injury in the spinal cord. The drawback is that it's surgery very close to the brain. The, more recently, so there has been um, a transplantation of uh, olfactory bulb cells. There are also um, approaches to transplant neural stem cells and G2 glia. And the, um, in all these um, cases, there has been some recovery of locomotion. Um, even when the transplantation was applied two to three months after the injury. So what is thought is that demyelination is taking place. The question is, do you have axonal growth too? Is it that they are being permissive to axonal growth? Is it that they might also be promoting neurogenesis? Why, are, why is it so pro-regenerative? Is it just demyelination or is more going on? Either way, it is important to think that whatever is going on during regeneration, you would wish there will be some reestablishment of correct circuit function. And if you did have neurogenesis, that you have circuit integration, because what you want in the end is good, appropriate behavior so that you can walk about and move as normal. I was going to show you this, this video of a transplantation of olfactory bulb cells in a human and the remarkable a human with spinal cord injury, and the remarkable recovery, but we couldn't get it to work. Um, but you can look at it later on your mobiles or at home or whatever. And it's pretty amazing because this is a person, and uh, it's really encouraging. So the question we want to ask, or the question we are asking is, um, how does the context of regeneration relate to development. So what can we learn from developmental biology, the development of glia in the nervous system, to then try to understand regeneration? And the thing to remember from development that I mentioned at the beginning is that glial cells are required for axonal navigation. So they help axons find their way. So they help circuitry. They help establish axonal uh, circuits, neural circuits. They uh, promote, they produce um, trophic factors, so uh, factors that will maintain neurons alive. They, they produce factors that make um, uh, neural stem cells proliferate, or, or they themselves may be neural stem cells. So um, these developmental functions can help us understand how to get around the problems that we find in injury. So in injury, we find that glial cells can secrete the factors that are inhibiting to, um, uh, uh, sorry, in the adult, compared to development, in the adult, the glia can produce factors that um, limit axonal growth, and this is important for the maintenance of the stability of the neural circuits. And then what happens in injury is that these same factors now prevent axonal growth, and what we want to understand is, all right, so this is the functions that they're doing in the adult anyway, how can we encourage them to do functions that they would normally be doing in development? So more with axonal navigation, trophic support, and regulation of uh, proliferation, and so on. So um, whatever we, whichever way we go about it, to be able to promote regeneration, we need to uh, ensure that we have these processes going on fine, so we have cell survival, 
that um, we have the production of uh, neurons, um, that we have circuit integration and synapse formation and restore plasticity. So what we're hoping is that we can understand these functions of glia that take place in normal development to then we can use them to understand regeneration. So in my lab we have been focusing on this aspect here and this is what we will be talking about uh, in the next uh, lecture on um, uh, the molecular mechanisms of glial regeneration and injury. I won't uh, tell you why the fly is so good because you've heard about it so much. And I think you heard from Angela, I understand, talking to her last night, that she's told you about the different types of glial cells in flies. I won't, go in, I won't be going on over this any more than that, than this. Just to mention that the terminology, the names of astrocyte or oligo or so, don't always apply so well to Drosophila because, you know, 600 million years apart. So I won't be using these names when I talk about Drosophila. Uh, but here, from a review that we wrote recently, you can see what aspects are shared between mammals and the Drosophila glia. And that's that for now. And uh, yeah, I hope that's okay. I'll see you later.